So one of the things that it's worthwhile to do when evaluating your forest is to look for signs of disease or damage in the trees there. So let's take a look around. This is a great time of year to be looking at this because as the trees are leafing out, that gives you a sense of which ones are alive, the ones that have leaves on them, obviously. So in general, this does look like a pretty healthy forest. I see a lot of greenery. The canopy looks pretty full and healthy. Not a lot of signs of disease in the canopy. But we can see off to the side here, we do have a number of American beech trees that have clearly been infected with beech bark disease. So they have that kind of gnarly, cankered bark that indicates that they're afflicted with that and may die of it at some point in the future. What else do you see? Over here on one of these small saplings, we can see oh, yeah. where a deer has rubbed its antlers, uh, removing some of the bark, and that tree probably won't survive. It's limited to one tree. So overall, mm -hmm. I think you're right. This really does look like quite a healthy forest. Mm -hmm. Next, we should be looking at what kinds of species of trees we have here, and what about their ages? Are, is this a uniform stand of one species, all of the same age, or is it a lot of diverse species of diverse ages? As we look around, we can see big trees and medium-sized trees and even small saplings mm -hmm. and seedlings on the forest floor. So it looks like we have a diversity of tree ages. Yeah. What about the species you see here, Julie? There's quite a variety of them. So even if you're not that great at tree identification, you can look at the bark, usually gives you an indication of the different species. Bark, of course, changes quite a bit over the course of a tree's life. But you can see the different textures and shadings of bark tell me that there are quite a lot of trees here. So I see some red oaks and some white oak and quite a few beech trees. What about all this stuff in the understory? In the understory, cool. we've got some young trees of those yeah. species you just mentioned, but we've also got um, hop hornbeam, mm -hmm. and I see I some uh, service berry. So tree identification, it's kind of a lifelong pursuit. You can know a lot, but there's nobody who really knows everything about it. Trees are like people. Each one's an individual, and they change as they grow. So we have a lot of tools to help us identify trees. There's all kinds of field guides, dichotomous keys that you can get. But since this is the 21st century, I'm going to show you how to use an app. So there's this great app. It's called Seek by iNaturalist. And it's really simple. You just load it on your phone, and then you point your camera at whatever you're trying to identify. And it will go through you know, as closely as possible, kingdom, phylum, class, order, all the way down to genus and species, if you can get a good enough picture of it. It's not that great with tree bark. It can get some tree bark identification okay, um, but that's a little trickier. So I use it mostly when I can get access to leaves, which mostly means seedlings and saplings because tree leaves are too far up in the air. So I've got this on my phone, and I got this little seedling right here. Let's see if we can figure out what this is. So I'm just gonna point my camera at it, and it's thinking, it's thinking. Uh, it knows it's an oak, but it's not confident enough to tell me what species. Now, I know that this is a red oak, but you can see these leaves are not fully expanded yet. They're really tiny. So on this one, I think genus is the best we're going to get. But let's go see if we can try this on some other seedlings. All right, what is this? It's got leaves that look a lot like maple leaves at the three lobes kind of structure. This is a maple leaf viburnum. That's really interesting because that's not a tree at all. So that comes up on the phone, and if I click on View Species, it'll tell me all about it. It's a native. It shows me the range map and the seasonality of it. So when you can identify the species, it'll give you more information about it. So this is an understory shrub species, as it turns out, not a tree at all. But you can see why they call it the maple leaf viburnum, because those little leaves look a lot like maple leaves. So here is a whole bunch of seedlings that all look really similar. They have these kind of elongated leaves with the rounded lobes on them. Let's see if we can figure out what that is. So you have to adjust the camera a little bit, go at a couple different angles to see if it'll pick it up. Okay, it knows it's an oak tree. Let's see if we can get the species. Chestnut oak. 
So chestnut oak also has this deeply ridged bark, and I can see that there's several of them around us on the hill, so that must be why there's so many of these seedlings. There's quite a lot of trees here that drop the acorns that these all grew up from. Yeah, there are a lot of different age classes in here, which is great to see. This is actually something that you might not see in all the forests of Dutchess County. Because um, remember we talked about how the deer browse the understory so severely that there's not a lot of regeneration of the tree species. And so what you end up with is a forest that's full of grown up mature trees, but no seedlings and saplings. It's like a town without any children. It's like all you know, not all old people, but all mature people, <laughs> and no young ones that can come in and, and grow up and take over when the older trees become diseased and died as, you know, they will at the end of their lifespan. So that's something else to look for in terms of the age of, the age classes of trees that are present, not just the diameters of the trunks, but also the vertical stage that they are at and how much understory vegetation there is. So it's great to see that we have some seedlings here that are going to be the next generation mm -hmm. if some disturbance takes place and takes out the larger trees. So that's another sign of a healthy forest. In our healthy forest checklist, one of the things it talks about is lichens on trees. And if we look at different mm -hmm. of the larger trees yeah. in this forest, yeah. we can actually yeah. see there are quite a few lichens growing on the trees um, that probably means um, these trees are, are not suffering from a lot of pollution. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of misconceptions about lichens. I think because they do look kind of scabby in their growth form, so people tend to assume that they're a negative sign. But actually lichens are a very positive sign of forest health. They're indicators of good air quality, and they don't harm the trees at all. So lichens are, are a good indication to find in your forest. One of the things we are going to be looking at as we evaluate this site is the amount of organisms that are living here besides the trees. And so one of the areas that holds a tremendous amount of life that we don't often think about are the soils on the site and the area where the soils meet the leaf litter and the fallen logs. And so if we were to look closely through here, I bet we would find there's a lot of different organisms both in the soil and at the soil surface level that are helping to be the um, foundation for the whole food chain in this, in this forest community. What about standing trees and dead logs? What do you see in here, Julie? Well, there's definitely some downed woody debris. So we've got all the way from tree trunks to small branches and kind of scattered throughout. Not a huge concentration of them, but a good amount. And so as Mike said, those are great habitat for things that are decomposing them. So there's an incredible amount of, um, of a food web going on in that kind of material. And that is basically going to decompose kind of back into the soil, which is where it came from in the first place, into those nutrients and, and carbon that'll be, become part of the soil and taken up by the next generation of trees. The next thing we're probably going to be looking for is other species of wildlife, uh, the larger organisms that move across the landscape. And we're not seeing anything right here right now, but we can see signs of them. And so if we look in different places along the forest floor, we can see where wild turkeys have scratched up the leaves. Yeah. We can see places where the deer have left droppings. Uh, just a minute ago, we were hearing a red-tailed hawk calling. So we think we probably are pretty close to a hawk's nest probably, yeah. and maybe upsetting them a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, um, hawk. Yeah. So we're seeing lots of sign of large vertebrates here. Mm -hmm. um, early in the morning, you'll hear lots of birds in this area. So we think it's probably habitat that's used by a lot of neotropical migrating songbirds as well. Um, right now, we're not hearing much, but it's the middle of the day, so they're kind of silent and doing other things. Mm -hmm. um, there's also lots of wildlife that are hidden. Um, they're hiding under the leaves, they're hiding under these fallen logs, and if we were to look around, I think we would probably find uh, red Fs, mm -hmm. um, oh, other sure salamanders lot. perhaps, yeah. and lots of insects. And so much life in a forest is actually small. You need to sort of crawl around on your hands and knees with the magnifying glass to find you know, the insects and those small salamanders and all of that kind of biodiversity that's the base of the food web. 
So this is how you might go through your forest and do a very brief and easy kind of summary checklist of how healthy is the site. Um, you certainly can get into more depth than this, looking and evaluating all of these aspects in a higher level. Um, but the basic first step is great to just go through and see, what do I see here? And, and do I feel like this is a healthy forest? And maybe what does it need to be more healthy? Mm -hmm. Here's a good example of some of the impacts that deer can have on our forests. This is a young chestnut oak seedling. We can see on this side where there's a nice new growth of a bunch of leaves that have broken this spring and started to be uh, formed. But on this side, there's not much there. And that's because deer have been in here during the winter and have fed on these young shoots. And each of these shoots has been picked off by a deer as it browsed its way along. Deer have no teeth on the upper part of their mouths in the front. And so when they bite, they bite and tear. And so what we can see here is a torn piece of the stem. And that tells us this was deer and not some other organism. Too many deer means not enough seedlings for the next generation of forest. So that's certainly something you want to be paying attention to when you're looking at your forest. Are you seeing signs of excessive amounts of deer damage? Well, here we are, Julie, in a different stand. It looks a lot different to me. What do you think? It looks a lot different. There is a lot going on here. Where do we, where do we even start? Well, what about uh, signs of disease or damage from our Healthy Forest checklist? Yes, and yes, in that order. There's a lot of disease. You can see some trees that have died from emerald ash borer. There's quite a number of those around here. Right here. One. Another one. And the damage, you know, there's a tree that's been tipped up probably in a windstorm that has fallen over. So there's quite a lot more wood on the ground here. Probably some of these that are dying from emerald ash borer have been shedding their branches. So there's quite a lot of wood on the ground and quite a lot of disease. So we've got a disturbance that's both natural from the fallen logs mm -hmm. as well as man induced by the introduction of a pest, emerald ash borer. And the result is an opening in the canopy, a gap. Yeah. And what's happening as a result of that gap is we're getting a proliferation of small plants on the forest floor. And not all of them are particularly happy to see here. <laughs> so I see a lot of things like yeah. uh, bush Honey, honeysuckles. Honeysuckle, barberry. Barberry. What else is here? There's some, that looks like some olive, olive over there. Olive, burning bush. So a little bit of seeing, everything. Almost. We're seeing uh, quite a few invasive plants that are taking advantage mm -hmm. of this gap in the forest and the extra sunlight that's, that's seen here. Yeah. Are we seeing uh, signs of tree re regeneration on the floor here? There are some. A lot of what you're seeing in the sort of shrub to seedling layer is the invasive stuff. But there's some tree seedlings here too. Here's a maple and an oak seedling. There's a few, but the, they're competing with all of these invasives, so they may or may not be able to thrive here. Now, what about the different age classes? This looks a lot different than the forest we were in before. Yeah, this to me looks like it was probably abandoned from cultivation or some form of management at one time and everything kind of grew up about the same age. Mm -hmm. All the trees are pretty much in the same age class for the most part. Yeah. Not a lot of diversity here in terms of ages of different trees. Yeah. Now, what do we see in terms of lichens on the trees? I see a bunch here. Yeah. And we would probably expect that the air quality here wouldn't be that different than the other yeah. site we were just at. Exactly. And there might even be more here because we're in an area with a stream running through this little ravine. So more humidity would make a better environment for the lichens. But they can tolerate a lot of different conditions. Sure. In terms of wildlife, we've got a diversity of habitats here with mm -hmm. the stream yeah. and the forest floor and the hillside beyond it. So I think we may see potential to see lots of different wildlife in these areas. We'd have to do some scouting to see what we could find. 